Um, That's the name of the different type of variable. So if it's countable, does it, can we, if it's countable, what is a countable variable called? Continuous. Try it again, countable. Discrete. Discrete. If it's a measurable variable, it's called what? Oh, continuous. Continuous. What's the difference between counting something and measuring something? For instance, let me ask you a question. Do you count your height or do you measure your height? You measure your height. Why do you measure your height and not count it? Because there's going to be, accounting is like more like whole numbers. and measuring. Thank you. That's what I want to hear right there. When we count, we count with whole numbers. If you count something, it has to be a whole number. Hence the word discrete. Discrete really just means that it has to be a whole number. So when you say the word discrete or something is, is countable, you're saying that it's a whole number. All right. And then the difference between counting and measuring, then measuring means that you can have actually fall into different intervals or different parts. So you can have a part of something. And remember, I tried to give you an example. If you try to measure your height, well, you might say that you're five, five, but really you're five, five and maybe a quarter of an inch. But if you had a better tool, you could be five, five and three eighths of an inch. Or if you had an even better tool, you could be five, five and, you know, seven sixteenths of an inch. Those type of things happen when you measure. So there aren't really whole numbers. So we try to place you into intervals, right? So when we talk about these particular distributions or these particular graphs we're gonna make, these particular graphs really should focus on whether you're counting the variable. So whether you have a discrete variable or if you are measuring the variable, which means you have, you have a continuous variable. Um, the first graph I'm about to show you, your first graph I'm about to show you is what we call the, uh, Y'all make sure y'all let me know if somebody gets in the waiting room too, please. Or if y'all, if you see somebody out there, because I don't know. Um, the first type of graph we're gonna make is called stem and leaf plot. We're gonna make a stem and leaf plot. Generally speaking, stem and leaf plots are used for discrete data, which means they're countable data. But that's not always the case. This actually you can go with a continuous R discrete variable. Thank you. So um, I just want you to know that most of the time you're supposed to actually assess what type of variable it is. But for us, we really don't care because these graphs are pretty much interchangeable. And that's because of the way we present the data. If you look here, it says, hey, can somebody read this for me, please? It says the following data represents the weight of carry-on luggage in pounds for a flight from Houston to Dallas. Construct a stem and leaf plot for the data. Thank you so much. So if we're measuring in pounds or something, what kind of data should that be, by the way? Continuous. That, continuous, that is continuous data. But look how the data is presented to us. The data is given to us all as what? In whole numbers and discrete. Whole numbers. So it's given to us in a discrete format. So really and truthfully, it doesn't matter. All right. And so what we're going to do with this data now is we're going to organize it in such a way that we want to display it. We want to display it through what's called a stem and leaf. In a stem and leaf plot, here's how this works. I'm about to make this a big so I can see it. What you're going to do is make sure your data is organized. Um, I think this data is already organized. And by that, I mean, you need to make sure it's ordered. Is this data ordered? So when we look at this data, if we go down like this, I think it's in order, right? Correct. Down up the road, that is in order. So now that it is ordered, the first thing I'm gonna do is this. In a stem and leaf, here's how the stem and leaf was created. We take what's called a, the leaf is going to be on this side. And your leaf is equal to the frequency. Does anybody remember what frequency is? The number no. of time a number occurs. How many times it so, comes up? This, how, how often it occurs. So your leaf is equal to your frequency. So your leaves are gonna represent your frequency. And then you're going to use your stems. Your stem is going to represent your intervals that you're putting numbers into. And I don't know if y'all remember what we did last time. Um, we broke it into different classes. We broke it into classes. And that's essentially what you're doing here. You're breaking things into classes and you're saying, this falls into this class. This falls into this class, right? So when I look at this, what I'm gonna do is I first need to identify the easiest thing when you do it, when you make a stem and leaf is to identify the actual leaf. And the leaf is always a single digit. The leaf is always a single digit. So this is just one digit from the number. So when I identify leaves, what I'm gonna do is this, because it's a single digit, when I go in here, right? When I go in here, I'm circling one digit. I'm always gonna circle what's called the trail digit or the last digit. And I want you to see what I'm doing. 
this only has one digit, so I'll circle it here. This only has one digit, I'll circle here. But this one has two, circle the last digit, the trail digit. These are your leaves. These are what we call our leaves. And so all of these numbers that I'm circling are going to be leaves. I'm gonna circle a few of them so you can see what I'm doing here. And I'll circle up to, I'll stop here because that's enough. And then you got the idea. All those numbers are gonna be leaves. All right. And what we're gonna do now with this, with this particular, to make this graph is, we start off by, once we know what the leaves are, we're going to do like this, like this. And then so now the stem, the stem is whatever number is left over when you circle those digits. So if you look here, your smallest stem, even though this is a single digit number, we probably should put a zero in front of it. So it's two digit like every other number in our data set. So put a zero in front of that one and a zero in front of that one. And then you have your stems are gonna be, if you look here, you have zero as a stem. These are all your ones as a stem. Here go all your twos as a stem, right? Then you have threes as a stem all the way up to your fours as a stem. Y'all see that? So we have, these numbers are gonna create the stem. The stems are zero, one, two, three, and four. Zero, one, two, three, and four, those are my stems. And now because the data is ordered, what do I do, what do, I do next? I go and I pick up every one of these numbers in order that fall in each one of the stems. So for instance, this one is the number one, it goes in my first stem, so I would do zero, one, and then I'd have zero, three. So I have two numbers and I have two numbers that fall in that zero range. In the next one, I have the numbers uh, two. I think that's a two. Yeah, two, seven, eight, eight, and looks like a nine. And what you wanna do when you write your numbers out, you wanna keep them spaced out as much as possible. You want to keep them evenly spaced as much as possible. So you want them to line up like this, because what you want to see now is in this particular stem right here, in the teens, in the teens right here, you have a lot more numbers than you did in these single digits. But if you go to your twos, hey, can somebody call those out to me? Because I can't see them, and I'm not going to try to see them. What's yeah, the first uh, two? Um, one. One. And then the second one is a two. Two. We're going to write them all. So what all are one, Well, it's two, one, two. one. We got to write them all. Ones. Thank you. So look, good point. When we do this, we need to write them all. So we have one, one, what else? Call them out. Uh, three twos, a three. Two, 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 three. Two fives. Two fives, thank you. Uh, six and two eights. I only six. know, one, yeah, two. we're, yeah, I don't think those are right. It's, Let's go back. So it's one, one. Sorry, I was looking at two, number three. <laughs> seven 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 nine all right go back let's start all over again what's the first number let me look thank y'all for y'all help and someone's so in the way have... time, by yes, the way they are aren't they oh no Disciplines. you sure how about everybody in? all right if they're still there they'll come back in my left, that's my fault. So look, uh, here's what we have. When I look at this, I see one, one, two, uh, seven, 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 and nine. That's in the twos, right? So we're gonna write them all out. What was it? One, one. Two. Thank you. Seven, seven, seven. Nine. Three seven. Three, three seven. Two seven. Yes. Three, three seven. Yes. And, and then one nine. nine. Yeah. Good. In the threes, what do we have? Y'all got the y'all got what I'm doing now? Zero, one, two, 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 three, five, five, six, eight, eight, and that's it. Good. Thank you so much. And in the fours I have one, two, 
three, five, seven. Thanks. There. This is the distribution. This is the sin and leave plot. And here's how it works. Here's how you read the sin and leave. All right. First thing, when you create any stem and leaf, we always create a key with it. Our key says this. Our key takes the first digit and it says this. We have zero slash one that equals the number one. That way, when anybody reads this, they can tell you what those values are. So I know that I read the slash or you might even want to do one slash two that equals the number 12. That way, when you read it, you know that that slash represents basically a, um, a 10 spot. So we're going to go... And at first, when you have the numbers 1 and 3, then you have 12, 17, 18, 18, 19. You have 21, 21. I see it now. There. Uh, 21, 21, 22, 27, 27, 27, 29. And you have 30, 31, 32, 32, 32. So you see, I have all those numbers sitting there, right? This right here, when I look at this, a stem and leaf plot holds a very valuable concept in statistics called that says it preserved data. When I say preserved data, what I mean is this. When I look at this particular graph, I can tell you every value that went into making the graph. So I know every value that was in the data set to make this graph, all right? And what it's doing is it's counting the frequency of the intervals. And so when you look here, you can tell me that the most frequent interval is what interval? What interval did most of your values occur in? 30s. Anybody answer? The 30s. 30s. So your, most of your values are occurring in the 30s, right? Very few values occurred in the ones over here, right? Means those values over here, right? Can you tell me what is the minimum value here? What's the minimum value? One. One. So this right here is the minimum. You can pick out the minimum here. Can you tell me the maximum? 47. This is the max value, right? So if the min is equal to one and the max is equal to 47, what's the range equal to? 46. Thank you so much. So my range, how do I find the range again? Biggest number. Max. Subtracting from the minimum. Good. Max minus min. So that's 47 minus 1 is 46. What does that 46 mean in terms of this problem? That it Talking expands about over 46. What, what expands over 46, huh? I mean, what expands over 46? Your I data mean, expands no, over 46. Keep going. Be, put it in context. Put it in context. What are we talking about? The weight of the carry-on luggage. Weight of the carry-on, right? Weight of carry-on luggage. And so what are we saying about the weight of that carry-on luggage? It always the small, between one. From the smallest, from the smallest carry-on luggage, somebody had a, a carry-on luggage that weighed how much? One pound, right? Somebody had a carry-on luggage that weighed 47 pounds. Everybody got that? That's a 46 pound difference between the smallest and the largest. That's how we want to say something like that. It's a 46 pound difference between the smallest and the largest. Now, I can also find other things from this particular graph, which are nice. I can find the mean and the median. I can find the mean. How do you find the mean again? How do we find the mean of a data set? I haven't talked about it explicitly, but we should know how to find the mean. How do you find the average? You add up all the data and then divide by the number of... And be, of because this preserves the data, because I know what every value in the data set is, I can actually find the actual mean using that method, right? I can also find the median. The median is the middle value. Um, I know how many total values there are. There are one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six. There are 30 total values in this data set, right? Where should the median occur about? The 13th. 30 total value. Sorry, again, 30 total values. The 15th and 16th value. Yeah, between the 15th and 16th value. That's where the median should occur at. So well, let's verify that it occurs between the 15th and 16th values. Uh, what does it mean to be a median again? Can you remind me? Do you remember? That might be something else. To have the same number. Good. Good answer. To have the same number on both sides, right? So look, to do it, one, we're here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 in between here. So it should occur somewhere inside of here. And what that really means is that if I count here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 values are on this side. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 values on that side. So the median is occurring right here. That's my median. What is the median equal to? But well, what's between 50 and 51? 
What number is between those? What's halfway between 50 and 51? 50.5. 50.5. If you need to do math for that, you can do 50 plus 51 and divide that by two. So you're gonna get 101. 101 divided by two is 50.5, all right? So these are just things that I can look at from this graph and tell you. And these are things you need to be able to pick up and make this graph. Are we okay with making this graph? Yes or no? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna show you a second version of this graph, which we call a high, low, or repeated stem and leaf plot. It's called a repeated leaves. And what it means by repeated is, when you make a repeated stem and leaf plot, it's called repeated because what's happening is you're getting too many stems or too many leaves in one stem. For instance, and there's 30 stem, this is a lot so of leaves in this. I, I have a question. Uh, why, can I ask why it's 50.5? Is it supposed to be? Point five? Because it's it's fifty. You you take it's really so just because so what right you're here. saying is just like half. Yeah, it's halfway in between fifty and fifty one, gotcha. right? Okay. Because you can't say it's fifty. You can't say it. You can't say it's it's halfway. But I don't know why I said fifty point five. I said that wrong. Okay, yeah, I was I'm, in, I'm like, right. isn't it thirty? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm like, 30, isn't, right. I'm missing something. Nah, okay, <laughs> that was me. It's thirty point okay, five. <laughs> Good catch. Thank you for catching it because nobody else caught that. I'm sure y'all were like, what is he talking about? Nah, 30.5, you're right. Good catch. But what I was saying, so you understand it. You just, I just messed you completely up. That was my Yes, fault. I'm like, where'd you get 50 from? Am I missing <laughs> I got stuff? You. That's my fault. Sorry about that. All right, so back to the repeated stem and leaf plot. A repeated, it's called repeated. A repeated stem and leaf. Because what you're going to do now is this. In a repeated stem and leaf, you're going to create your stems by repeating them. And what I mean by that is this. You'll have what's called zero, high, uh, zero low, zero high. One low, one high. Two low, two low, two high. Three low, three high four low, four high. And here's how this works. If a number is, if a leaf is low, a low leaf, if it's a low leaf, these are the digits zero through four. If it's a high leaf, these are the digits five through nine. So when you go through your frequency, since I already have the stem and leaf sitting right here, then when I look here, I can see in zero low, I have the numbers one and three. In zero high, there's nothing. In one low, I have the number two. In one high, I have the numbers seven, seven, I'm sorry, seven, eight, eight, nine. Eight, eight, nine. One question. In two, yeah, go ahead. The low and high, is zero to four, that's universal unit for any? Yes, type or any type of repeated stem and leaf. It's called oh. a repeated stem and leaf. Or it's called, a, you might see it even called low high leaf. Oh, okay. Yeah, we just split the, we split the digits basically. You take five digits to the low side, five digits to the high side. Zero through four are low, uh, five through nine are high. Okay, gotcha. All right, too low. Uh, too low will have one, one, and two. Too high will have seven, 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 nine. Three low will have, here's where it gets important. Here's why we do it. Cause now you see in three low, you have uh, zero, one, two, 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 three. So zero, one, two, 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 three. And then zero high, you, I mean, three high, you have five, five, six, eight, eight. Right, four low, you have one, two, three, four high, you have five and seven. Now, why won't my pen write? 
five and seven. Yeah. And I'm going to show you another reason we're doing this, though. So write that down real quick. Like, um, so I want you to notice something because we're going to talk about this in a second. But what I'm really interested in is um, if I were to, in particular, turn these graphs over and start doing something like this or just make bars over them, they really represent for numerical data, they represent bar charts. You can make kind of like bar charts out of these. And what we really talk about is a histogram, but you get this bar chart that looks like this and you start drawing bars over these, you see that? And you can do the same thing over here. And what this is doing is it's approximating what we call our shape of our data. And shape is a very big thing in statistics. Right, but I want you to notice that you get two very different shapes when you when you actually draw these graphs, and one is more informative than the other. Um, this one provides more detail because now I see that when I look at it, I see that I have when you look at your low numbers, these low numbers one and three are very inconsistent with the rest of the da the data themselves, right? And what I mean by that, they're pretty far away from the rest of these data, the rest of this data right here, right? And in particular, these might be one in three pounds. These might be people who went away, who got away for like a, you know, maybe a day, a day trip, right? Versus these people who are bringing in all of this over here. Typical luggage, it looks like was around, typical weights were around the 30s, right? So these people may not have stayed as long on trips is what this is saying. So that's what this is just saying when you apply it to the real life context what we're talking about. But you have two different graphs that show the, that show the same information but they show them differently. They give you different pieces of information about it, all right? Now, do I care if you can make, do I care which one you make? Not in particular, but I do need you to know how to make both of them and how to read them, all right? So are there any questions about how to make this graph and how to read this graph? Are we okay with that? Anybody got any questions? Nope. All right, so we're good on that graph right there. So let's go to the next graph. So the right side one is called stem and leaf. What was the left side one called? They're both, they're both called stem and leaf. One is called a repeated stem and leaf. This is a standard stem and leaf right here. This is, standard. This, was, okay. this, is this is a standard stem and leaf. This is called a repeated stem and leaf. It's called repeated because you're repeating your, your stems. Okay. It's called the repeated stem. So Thank you're repeating your stems. There you go. Gotcha. All right. So this next one, we're going to talk about what we call the shape of a distribution, our shape of distribution. And so when we talk about shape, shape is going to look at two, we're gonna look at what we call our center values first. So let's start there. We're gonna talk about the center values of a distribution, the center of a distribution. And when I talk about the center, when I talk about the center of a distribution, I'm either talking about one of two things. Technically, there are three things. We're only going to focus on two. When I talk about the center, I'm talking about either the mean or I'm talking about the median. I'm talking about the mean or I'm talking about the median. That's what the center of a distribution typically talks about. And so when we talk about the center, the center just means what are my, what are the typical values for this distribution? So center really just means typical. What are the typical values for my distribution? Right? And so when I focus on this, um, what example do I have here? We'll come back to that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at this thing that we call, or actually, let's do this first. I wanna find, the mean of this distribution right here. I want to find the mean of this distribution right here. So I want to make sure we can do that in Excel. So let's go ahead and open up Excel and try to knock out that, all right? I will do my best to, to do this with y'all. So let me open Excel up. I want to share my screen. Wait. 
Don't want to do that yet. All right, so hey, in Excel, you're gonna have to actually type these numbers in because I didn't make a data set for them, I'm sorry. So let's go ahead and start typing those in. Type them into a column, please. Type them into one column and we'll make sure we know how to manipulate that column finding summary statistics first. Quick question, do we need to leave a room for like a header or just start at the very top? You can give it a header if you want to. Um, okay, but it's not needed. Yeah, it's not. Okay. Watch how big I make this so I can see it. Twenty-seven, five, two, four, three, four. Y'all keep typing. It may take me a few minutes, but I'm gonna get that with y'all. Hey, is that last one typed incorrect? Yeah, I'll make sure my numbers are correct because I can't see them, but I feel like they're correct. Yes, they're good. All right, cool. So these are, what are these, by the way? These are the, here's an example. It says an, economic, an economist wishes to study the distribution of household incomes in a Midwestern city. To do this, she randomly selects 12 households from the city and determines their last year's, uh, their last year income. The incomes are given below for this data, find the mean and the median. So in this particular distribution, everybody know how to order data, by the way? You know how to order your data? Yes, I'm assuming yes. you know how to order data, yes. okay. There's a, there's a filter button to order data too, if you want to order like that, but we just want to find the mean and the median. So I'm going to use mean and median functions, but there actually is- data, do you mean like in Excel, there's a way to like make it go in order? Yes, there is. Do oh, I need to I show you that? Filter, uh, I think I'm good. Do you see it? All right, cool. So um, here, if I want to just do the mean, equals the mean, I don't know if that says mean or not, equals the mean, that's the geometric mean. Actually, when you do it in Excel, it's the average you're looking for. So equals the average, right? So take average, drag down, do that. Here's your mean. So that's the mean value. Let's do it up here. Let's find the median value. Um, Excel, I think, has a median function. Does that say median? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Hey, I'm, I'm not lying. To you. I'm really like blind right now. It's so hard for me to see anything. That's the median value. Now, here's why this matters. So when I look at this, I see the mean and the median, right? What do you notice about them? Let's compare them real quick. What do you notice about them? It's one bigger or smaller than the other that I'm really asking. The mean is larger than the median the by about mean is larger grand. than the, good. The mean is larger than the median about 10 grand. Let me help you make this make a whole lot more sense. Um, let me bring an example real quick. I'll show you what I mean by that. What was, was the median formula again? Just equals median. Just type in the word median. That was, that's what mine was at least. <laughs> Not sure if I did something wrong. My numbers are off. 
maybe you typed it in wrong. Maybe type something in there wrong. Maybe I typed something in wrong. Did I type something in wrong? Um, I think I, think uh, I, I could be. Suspect. I missed this. I missed the and step up to order them. How did you order them? I didn't order. I didn't order them at all. I mean, oh. you can order them if you want to, but to in order the, them, you should have a. Sorry, you should have. Go ahead. I mean, you can. You, you got a way to order. You can order. There should be just a filter function on the order. Sure. Like you should be able to do. I think uh, your row eight and row yeah. nine. Different. Yeah. Thank you. What should they be? Row eight what is here. What should that be? Row nine. Forty nine three twelve. Right here. Yeah. yeah. What do I have? Forty eight three twelve. No, forty nine three twelve. Mm hmm. That's not right. Forty nine three twelve. That's right. Yes. Yeah. What's the next one? Uh, seventy seven five forty. No, no, no. I got that. I got if, that one. Oh, yeah. It's uh fifty five two eighty three. Yeah. Fifty five. Is that's what this one should be. Fifty five two eighty three. Mm hmm. Fifty five two. <laughs> Better. Mm hmm. Yeah. Like more everybody else is. Thank you. I'm telling you, I can't see, man. Y'all gotta let me know. Let me know if I'm wrong. Let me know. I'm okay with being wrong tonight. I'm gonna be wrong on a lot of stuff. So look again. It's still it's about not... what's the. <laughs> Go ahead. What you say? I'm sorry. Oh no, I was laughing. You said you're good with being uh, wrong tonight. No, it was like just tonight. <laughs> yeah, just tonight. Just tonight. Because I don't want y'all get. I don't want y'all get in the habit of thinking y'all could be wrong too. You know, because y'all can't. But that's okay. So look, the difference between those two numbers is about. Almost ten thousand dollars, right? Nine thousand four, nine thousand forty dollars fifty cents. That is a huge difference. Let me show you even more. Go ahead, I'm listening. You were getting ready to show the mean again. And you okay, so you want me to show the mean? You want me to show the calculated again? Please. Yes. Uh, the means formula is just this. You see up here where it says average. The mean is just the average. They don't have a mean formula. So if you type in the word average. Start typing the word average, bring up average, and you just want to highlight those cells. So there isn't an actual true mean formula, but the mean is the average. They're the same thing, so you use the average formula. The median formula is actually in there. There's an actual median formula. So you type in the word median, the median will come up. You can also you find the median by using what we call percentile. We won't worry about that yet. All right. So now the reason I'm showing you that is because of this. Um, make sure I don't get these away. Yeah. Here's an example. Let me give you another example before we continue with this one. I'm gonna come back to my, I'm gonna come back to this in a second. All right, but I want to show you something. Uh, let's see here. So I got this a, a few years back, um, this information a few years back. Anybody know who these people are? Sports players. NBA Which sports players. players? Yeah. Rockets. Which sports players? Rockets. They used to be Rockets. <laughs> the Rockets have totally reloaded. They used to be the, the trash Rockets, right? And these right here are the salaries when they first signed Russell uh, Westbrook to the team. You see that? Notice here, Westbrook is making 38.5 uh, $38 million. Everybody got that? As a matter of fact, if you look at this, look how much Westbrook makes. He makes 38.5. And I'm going to write him like this so you can see him better, so it'll be easier to see him. That's 38.5 million. That's 38. Harden was making 38.2. Uh, Clint Capella, when they had him, was making 12. Then as you start to go down, I cannot see these numbers. This is nine. I got kicked off. Hold on, I gotta come back. All right, got kicked off. So look, nine, this is 2.5, 7.5, 3.5, 2.1, 2, 2.5, and 2.2. 2. And then the last one is 
So I want you to look at these numbers real quick. These are what they were making. These are their salaries. And realize these are by the millions. Um, notice here, if we were to find the average right here, if we were to find the average for this particular data set, you know what this average is right here? Anybody know that want to take a guess what the average is for this? The mean? What's the average for this? All right, y'all can go and actually calculate if you want to. I think it's around like, isn't it close to almost 14 million? Right? Somebody verify that? If you got spare time, just verify that. I think so. I think it's around 14 million. Let me know if I'm wrong in a few. So I think the mean is around 14 million. And I know the median for this data set is equal to about 3 million. Considerable difference, right? Everybody understand that? Why does this matter when I talk about center values then? And remember what I told you a center value was. A center value is a typical value. It's a typical value for data for distribution. Well, when I talk about center here, and let's say that as a collective bargaining unit, these players get together and they feel like they're not making enough money. They feel like they're not making enough money, right? So when they go to the owner, they're gonna be like, well, we think we should make more money. And the owner's gonna counter back and say, well, I'm, on average, I'm paying you $14 million. Is that a false statement? If he says I'm paying you $14 million. Yes, no, it's not a false statement. It's a true statement. Good, it's not a false statement. That is a true statement. Is it an accurate statement though? No. no. It's not an accurate statement because the typical player isn't making $14 million, right? As a matter of fact, we can see from these numbers, the typical player makes about how much? Three million. Three million. Three, million. Three million is way more representative than this 14 million. That's what I want you to understand. When we start talking about what we're talking about, it matters when people start throwing around interchangeably the mean and the median. Because you can talk about either one when you talk about center. And you'll see people do it all the time. For instance, they'll say the mean price, the mean household price for this neighborhood may be a certain amount. But that's because there's really two very expensive households in the neighborhood. And then the rest of the households all have a similar amount around them. But those two expensive households are these two salaries right here. What do they do to the mean? How do they affect the mean? How do these 40 million salaries affect the mean? Do they bring it up or down? They, they screw it up. up. They bring it up. And I want you to tell me why it skews it up. Why does it bring it up? Why does 40, why does that, those two 40 millions bring it up like because that? Because it's such a large difference from the average and the lower players make. So let's talk about that real quick. How do you find the mean? How do we find the mean? You add all the add numbers together and divide it by we the number add, of inputs. We got to add, we got to add every number up in the set, right? So that means if your number is very big, what is that going to do to the mean? It's going to make the mean what? Very Go big, up. right? If your number is very small, what does that do to the mean? It makes the mean do what? Go, Go down, down, right? Most of these players have small numbers. So their mean should be very small to begin with, right? But what ends up happening when you start throwing these $40 million players in, what happens? They drive the mean up to $14 million. And I'm glad somebody kinda, saying it, said it already. Kind of like you get a zero on a, on a grade and your, and your grade you go. goes way down. <laughs> there you go. That's like kind of when I give y'all, so for instance, let's say y'all want to curve on a test, right? And on the test, there are, let's say there's 20 people taking the test. 15 of y'all make 70s or 15 of y'all make four, let's say 60s. 15 of y'all make 60s, but five of y'all make hundreds. Guess what that does to the average? It's going to drive the average up. I'm like, well, based on the average, I'm not going to give you a curve. You're not going to want me to argue the average. You're going to want to argue the median because the median is more representative or more typical of the value. Those hundreds, and somebody said this earlier, those hundreds are skewing the data. And that's what I want to talk about when I talk about shape. So if we go back to what we got earlier, it says, what is the, one of the questions that were asked on this is, First question I was asking this is, what is the, for the this day to find the mean and the median? The mean, also known by the way, the mean, we call it X bar. The mean is what we call X bar. Let me drop this down. The mean is the value X bar written like this. This is read as X bar.
And this is called the sample mean. It's called the sample mean. There's two types of means, by the way. The other mean is called the Greek letter mu. This is the Greek letter mu. And it's called the population mean. Anybody tell me the difference between the sample and the population mean? The sample is like a certain group and the population is a whole amount of the people so, that... Matters. So let's look at this example that I'm working with right now. If I look at this example that I'm working with right now, we know that this is a sample, right? This is not every particular Midwestern home income, right? This is just a sample of 12, 12, uh, 12 incomes that I'm sampling from. So what kind of mean am I looking at? Well, this is what we call X bar. This is our X bar type of mean, all right? So when we talk about let me lock the code. So here, what was X bar equal to? What was the mean equal to in Excel? I'm sorry, I didn't write it down. Five six eight three nine point five. Five six. Eight three nine point five. What was the median? If you don't mind. Four seven seven nine nine. Four seven seven nine nine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So here we get. That's the mean. The median itself, by the way. The median is what we call the. Y'all call it the middle value. Y'all call it the middle value, and by middle you mean it splits the data in half. It splits the data in half. It's also known as what we call the 50th, the 50th percentile. Now we'll talk about percentiles later, but the median is a percentile. And so what this is going to help us develop now is this thing we call shape. And the next question is the question that I wanna use on shape is this, if you were the, uh, the economist, which value do you feel is more representative of the sample? So when I'm looking at this particular data set, what value do you think is more representative? The 56,000 or the 47,000? The 47, 47. Which one? The 47 is probably going to be more representative of the data set. As a matter of fact, why is this mean so high? What value is driving the mean up like that? That 150,000. This one right here. So this one particular income drives the mean up. It's six. All right? almost six times higher than the lowest one so it's just good it's almost six times higher than the lowest so what we're doing here is we're saying we already see this extreme value this extreme value is what we're going to refer to as an outlier it's an outlier and so when we talk about shape shape starts off by talking about this thing that we call either a distribution is symmetric or is skewed so now I refer to shape now, my distribution can be one of three things. It can start off by being what we call symmetric. In a symmetric distribution, the mean, here, let me draw the actual shape. I'm gonna draw them too. Let me use histograms. In a symmetric distribution, what we do, take a histogram, you're gonna draw a curve over it like this. If you have tails and approximately, if you have tails of equal length on both sides of the curve, when you draw it like that, you have tails of equal length on both sides of the curve, we generally say that the, this is symmetric and the mean is equal to the median. The mean equals the median. So here, the mean and median will sit in about the same area. They're gonna be about the same value. And they generally sit in the middle of the curve. They generally sit at the middle of the curve. Now, if a distribution is not symmetric, which means the tails are not going to be equal on both sides, then if it's not symmetric, then the other thing is you can either have a longer left tail or a longer right tail. All right, you can have a longer left tail or a longer right tail. So. If it is a longer left tail, we call it left skew, or also referred to as negative skew. In negative skew, I want you to see if you can tell me what negative skew means. The 
So here is what we call outlier. Skew which way though? Skew to the left by the outlier, right? So yeah. what does it mean in terms of the type of values you have in your data set? What type of values do you have in your data set? Smaller. A lot of, try it again. You actually have a lot of what here? You have a lot of the higher numbers. You have a lot of the higher numbers and very few of the small numbers. As a matter of fact, it's being skewed because you have those smaller numbers, mm -hmm. right? You can think of this as like an easy test. If you think of an easy test, here are people scoring hundreds, 90s, 70s, uh, 80s, 70s. Very few people are scoring 60s. Do you see that? In this distribution, the mean, the mean will always be less than the median. As a matter of fact, your mean will always lie somewhere in the tail towards the skew. The mean is somewhere in the tail, somewhere in the left tail. And what I mean by that, I don't want to say it's in the actual tail, but what I want to say is on that is so it'll be always to the left of the median, or it'll always be less than the median here. Likewise, your medians will always sit towards the peak. So your medians are always towards your peaks. So here you see the mean is on the left, the median's on the right, so the mean has to be less than the median. This is what we call left skew. In the left skew distribution, there are a lot more high values or very few low values in the data set. As a matter of fact, this word skew is talking about the mean. What is, the, what is it doing to the mean? It's skewing it to the negative values or to the lower values. If it's not symmetric, left skew, then it has to be, what's the other skew? Right skew. It's not right skew. In a right skew distribution, also known as what we call positive skew. In positive skew, the distribution is something like this, where you have a longer right tail. So here, your mean will be greater than your median. Here, your mean is greater than your median. And what that means is that the mean is going to, again, sit somewhere in the tail or towards the direction of the tail. And the median will sit somewhere out here in the peaks. All right. So what does this particular distribution tell me? It tells me I have a lot of what? I have a lot of low values and very few high values. If you look at the rocket salaries, for instance, what kind of distribution is the rocket salary? Is it left skew or right skew? Right skew. It's right skew. It's heavily right skew. You have very, as a matter of fact, these two people are out here, right? Everybody else is back this way. So it's right skew. If you look at this particular thing that we're doing then now, this particular example we're using here, Look at this example right here. Here is a graph that I provided you with. Here's a graph I provided you with, the histogram I provided you with, right? If we were to draw a curve over this, like this, here's what, the, here's what it would look like. What's the shape here? What would your right shape skew? be here? This is right, right skewed. Now, do I need a, do I need a graph to see that it's right skewed? I shouldn't because when I come over here, what do you notice? What's the mean? The mean the is mean? larger than the median. The mean is larger than the median, right? So here when it says why, uh, so the mean is larger than the median. We know that the mean is greater than the median. It's right skewed. If a distribution is skewed, if a distribution is skewed, and we always want to talk about the typical values. We always want to talk about a typical value. The typical value for a skewed distribution, you've already told me, is the median. So it says, if you were to, uh, if you were the economist, which value do you feel is more representative of the sample? You already told me the median. And the reason is because the distribution is skewed. Anytime the distribution is skewed, the median is always going to be a better value to talk about. It's always more representative of what you're talking about. All right. 
uh, why do you feel this value is more representative than the other ones? Well, what value is making it skew? The outlier. What value skews the outlier. So the outlier of 150,250 is skewing the mean value. So when we talk about shape, what we're really talking about is, is the distribution symmetric or is it skewed? If it is symmetric, if it is symmetric, then here's what I know. If it's symmetric, I know that the mean and median are equal. And the mean is always a better value to talk about. And I want to let I want to I want you to understand why the mean is always the best value to talk about. And it's easy to see that the mean is the best value to talk about when you think about the rocket player salary. How do we find the average of all the rocket players? What would we do? Take the sum, divide it by the number of players. Well, we'd have to add up every player and divide by that, right? So what would yeah. I what information I would be getting? I would get every player's salary. Does that make sense? If I know every player's salary to calculate it, then that's even better because now I have every value going into it. Over here, we come back over here. The average is about 14 million. The median is 3 million. Well, if this was a symmetric distribution, then this would be great. We know it's not symmetric. But sometimes, like we use the median, there's not even a 3 million inside of here. There's not even 3 million inside of here. So we're using a value that's not even part of the data set to be, let's say that it's typical. So that can happen. But when it's symmetric though, when it's symmetric, we can actually use the mean and the mean is calculated from every value. So we have a symmetric distribution. We wanna talk about the mean. But if a distribution is skewed, we talk about its median. So look at this next example. We're not gonna calculate that. It says, uh, I think on this one, that 150,200 was actually an error. So same values, the only thing that changes is this changes right here to that. So if you go back and change that value real quick, what's the new mean when you go back and change that value to 50,200? 48,506.17. Thank you. So if we change that one value, it changes the new mean. X bar is now what? Say it again for me, please. 48. 40. 506.17. Thank you, 506.17. The median, does the, did the median change when you do that? No, it does not. The median will not change. Why does the median not change? Why does the mean <laughs> drop and the median doesn't? The median stays the same because you still have an equal number of values. Good, because the median like, wants to sit where? Where does the median want to sit at? The median wants to sit where at? in the middle, right? It doesn't care if the value is very big or the value is very small. It's trying to put itself in the middle. On the other hand, the mean changes drastically because the mean is affected by those big values because that's how, that's how you actually find it. So here the median is still going to be, what's the median, what did I say it was? 47799, somewhere around there, 47799. Right. And so now we look at those two values. If you're looking at these values in terms of what's going on, by the way, this value changed drastically. This value changed. It's called a non resistant measure. It is the non resistant measure for center. I'm sorry. Yeah, non resistant measure for center. It's the non-resistant measure for center. What does non-resistant mean? The word non-resistant, what does like that mean? Like it's flexible? Like it doesn't, like it actually changes. Yeah, flexible is a good way of saying it. It just means that it changes. And that the mean is called the non-resistant measure for center. Generally speaking, if I ask you for a resistant, I'm gonna ask you for the resistant measure. The resistant measure for center it's called the median. The median will not change. The median doesn't change. It's resistant to change. Resist means if you resist something, you don't change. So, so the median would be your uh, discrete, and then the not that it's not. This isn't. Don't don't get that. No, nah, this is not that type of stuff. This is just saying okay. that 
one thing is resistant and one thing is non-resistant. A resistant okay. measure does not change, is not really and truly what it means. A resistant measure is not affected by outliers. The median okay. didn't care about that number. It's when we change the median from when we change from one uh, 150,000, 250 to just 50,000, 250, the median didn't change. It doesn't care about that number. It's resistant. The mean, however, changed drastically, right? The That's medium, because it's non-resistant. The Go mean ahead, it change because the numbers on its right and left are still the same, right? Right, and that's because the median wants, where does the median want to sit at? In the center. Okay. In the center, it doesn't care about what the actual values are, is what I'm trying to tell you. Okay. Now, by units. If, you look at the, if you look at the shape of this distribution here, look at the shape of it, what's the shape going to be approximately? Symmetric. It's approximately symmetric. If you look at the numerical summaries, what do you know about the numerical summaries? 48,000, 48,000, they're about the same here. So here your mean, we'll say approximately equal to your median. They're very close to each other, actually. And when the mean is approximately equal to the mean or the mean is equal to the median or they're very close like this, then a typical value is going to be the mean. So here you would say the mean of 48,506.17 is well representative of the sample. And that's because that's called a typical value. That is a typical value for the data set, all right? And you get that typical center value when it's symmetric. So if it's symmetric, we talk about the mean. If it's skewed, whether it be left skewed or right skewed, we talk about the median. Everybody understand that? Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah. Questions on the shape. Questions on shape. Any questions on shape? I wanted so, an example with a left skew. You just want an example of left skew? Um, yes. All left skew would be, if it were left skew, what would you see? Let's say, if it were left skew, what would you see? You would see a lot more big values. So like, for instance, if you want to look at like home prices in certain areas of Houston, right? You would have a lot of extremely high values. And if you look at like certain areas, you would have a few of those low values. So the only thing that's gonna be different about the graph is the graph will look something like this is left skew. And what you're really looking at, and I don't even want you to really focus on the graph because a lot of the times that can give you numbers. In a left skew distribution, what has to be true about the mean and the median? Left skew, the mean has to be what? Smaller than median. That's what you need to look for, all right? But if you get a graph, most of the time you can tell when you get the graph too. I just want to show you that the graphs actually are verified through the actual numerical summary, all right? Okay. All right, so let's go to the next part which is going to be our, what is this? Standard deviations? Yeah, let's talk about standard deviation and variance. All right. Um, it says that the standard deviation, right? And I'm gonna tell you what standard deviation is. We're gonna build it through this example right here. Right? So here's how this works. Here are some scores on a, says the following scores are a sample of test scores on the first test in this stat class. Here are the scores, right? Pretty impressive. We agree? No, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna find the standard deviation. I want you to understand this. I like doing the standard deviation by hand because it gives you an idea of what it actually means. Excel will do the standard deviation for you. All right, and we're gonna get there in a second. But in order to find the standard deviation, in order to find the standard deviation, I need you to do it by hand because doing it by hand really makes you understand what it really means. All right, so I'm gonna break down and the way I do the definition of standard deviation is I remember what the word standard deviation actually means. Standard, in statistics, standard just means the word normal. All right, standard means normal in statistics. But the word normal in statistics, guess what that means? If something is normal in statistics, what do you think that means? Average. Thank you so much. So the word standard actually means average. 
the word standard actually means average. So if I'm talking about a standard deviation, what am I talking about? I'm actually talking about a average deviation. Now, what is a deviation? Um, does anybody know what a deviant is? When we talk about a deviant, a person's a deviant if they- don't follow the norm. They don't follow normal, good. They don't follow normal, but what is normal again? Average. What does the word normal mean? Average. So here's what you're saying then. I wanna find the average deviation away from the average. That's what you want to find. I want to find the average deviation away from the average. So the word standard deviation, literally breaking it down and just to the word itself. When I talk about a standard deviation, this is the average deviation the average deviation. What do we call our average again? Mean. Mean. So this is the average deviation from the mean. How far do we deviate from the mean on average? That's what I'm asking you. All right. Now, take these test scores. I want to find their average deviation from the mean. What do I need to have first? The mean. I need a mean. So can we find the mean here? Anybody find the mean yet? 72. Is it 72? Sorry, no, that's the mean. Sorry. <laughs> You're good. Find the mean. I think it's 70. I tried to make it 70. It's easier with a number like 70. Somebody verify that it's 70 for me real quick. It's uh, no, 72. Really? It's supposed to be 70 plus 64 plus. You're right. It's not what I want it to be. Let's make it. I don't want it to be these numbers. I want it to be exactly 70. So make the, uh, what was it, 367? How did I get a number like that? Five times. I need to be 350. I need to take 17 off. Um, Make this 80, make that 79, make that 75, right? Make this one. How much did I take off right there? What was it before I just scratched it out? 82, so I took off five, I took off seven there. What was this one? Make this 81. Did I do that right? And then make this one. 70. Let's add those up, see what we get. 350, then it will be 70. Yeah, that, that I'm saying is I get I was trying to get it to 350. Did I get it there? 57 plus 64 plus 70 plus 75 plus 81. 69.4. <laughs> God, I did that wrong. Go ahead and do that right. I need to add three more. Make this 73. Fifty-seven. Well, that works to seventy. Good. That's what I want. I want these numbers right here. My fault. So, <laughs> I swear, when I be doing these examples myself, they all work out correctly, man. When I be with y'all, they just don't work. Anyway, so the average here, x bar, of this sample is equal to seventy. Everybody got that? I want these numbers because they work out nicely and it makes the math easier for us to do. What we're going to do now is we're going to find the average. We're going to go back and find the standard deviation. What is the standard deviation again? Standard deviation is the average deviation from the mean. What is the mean? The mean is What's 70. What's the mean? The mean is 70, right? So here's what we're going to do. We want to find the average deviation away from what number? 70. 70. So here's what we need to do first. In order to find that average deviation, what is a deviation? Well, look what it says. The deviation is x minus x bar. What does x bar stand for again? Mean. The sample mean. Sample mean here is 70, right? So what am I going to do? I'm going to take each one of these values and subtract it from what number? 70. What is 57 minus 70? Can anybody tell me that? What is 57 minus 70? Negative 13. Negative 13. Why is it negative, by the way? Because it's less than the, the mean. 
is less than the mean, so that's why it is negative. So we get a negative value there, negative 13. What about 64 minus 70? Negative six. Negative six, again, another value that is less than the mean, right? Here we go, 73 minus 70, what is that? Three. Three, why is that positive? Because it's higher than the average. It's above the mean, good. 75 minus 70 is five, and then 81 minus 70 is 11. So what I want you to understand right now, what we just found is what we call deviations. We found how far each value deviated away from the mean, right? Some of those deviations are positive and some are negative. But the goal is to find what, again, going back to the definition, the definition is the what? The average deviation from the mean. So what do I have right here? I have a mean. I also have a what now? I also have what? Your deviation. Deviation. So how do I, what do I need to find now? Then I need to find the average, average. of those deviations, right? Let's go add them up. Add them up, divide by the total, right? So I get negative 13. I'm using a calculator. If y'all want to use Excel, you can. And I'll, I mean, I'll show you how to do it. It's not, I don't want to do it in Excel right now. A, because I can't see it, but B, because it's not that important to use it right now. Plus five plus 11. There. When I try to add up all these numbers, verify that I get the same thing as me. Yes. So all is right, that a cool. way to like double check yourself? You should get zero? You should get zero. Yes, you should get zero. And the question is, why am I getting zero? Why did I get zero trying to find that average? What gave me zero? It's a negative. Because What's you're negative? measuring how far each of them are from it. Okay, so why did I get zero though? You're right. The mean. This is basically tell. This is basically telling me that the mean did its job. The mean did its job. It it minimized the deviations to zero. That's what the mean. That's the goal of the mean. By the way, the goal wants the deviations to be zero when you add them up like that. But why am I getting zero? What produces zero here? Some of the deviations are what? Negative. And some are what? Positive. So when you add negative and positive, what do they do to each other? They Ten. counteract with each other, right? They cancel each other out and they produce a sum. By the way, the symbol for sum is this. This means sum, it's Greek letter sigma. It's the Greek letter sigma. It means sum of, by the way. It means sum of. <laughs> and so here, when I add all these up, the sum of is zero. Which means the mean did its job. So there's a problem. And the problem is that we have those negative positives counteract, I mean, counteracting each other and they mess everything up. So how do I fix that? How do I get past that? Well, it'd be nice if they were either all negative or all positive. I don't want to make them negative because I don't like dealing with negatives a whole lot. So I'm going to make them all positive. And in math, we have two ways to make everything positive. Anybody have any ideas on how? Square. Squaring is one. So we square things or we can take the absolute value. In statistics, right. when we talk about, when we talk about standard deviations, we take absolute, we take um, squares, we square them. And square has two fact. The square actually has two factors here. One, it makes everything positive. But the other thing it does is, when I take negative thirteen and square, what is that equal to? They might tell me. So one sixty nine. That is one sixty nine. So negative thirteen squared is equal to one sixty nine. What about negative six squared? That is thirty six. Right. What about when I take three and square? What is that equal to? Nine. Nine. What about five and square it? 25. That is. And what about 11 and square it? 121. I want to understand something real quick. When you squared it, when you squared a number like negative 13, right? And you got 169. That is a really big number. Likewise, when you squared 11 and got 121, that is a really big number. But that also suggests then that those particular values in my data set, they were not very close to the mean. As a matter of fact, four, uh, 57 is not close to that mean of 70. 81 is not close to the mean of 70. 
And so what this really says is that if I go through and do this and I have a lot of large values, what does that tell you about most of the values in the data set then? If this value is very large when I add them all up, what does that tell you about most of the values? Most of them are far from the average. Good, most of them are far from the average. If that value is very small, such as if most of them are around this number right here, you had a very small value like that, what would they tell you about most of the values? They're very close to the mean, right? You got that? So, so when I sum all, I'm sorry, tell me, say it again. So will this kind of um, dictate or, or show if it's a skewed thing? Um, it can, it can, but we're not gonna use it to do that yet. But it, it really and truly when we talk about skew, we're gonna look at the mean and the median. But this can tell you about how spread out the data is. And so that can give you an idea of skewness. Um, we don't really talk about it like that. We can talk about kurtosis, which is actually a form of skewness based on the standard deviation, but we're not gonna talk about that. But so, but it really is telling you how spread out the data is from the mean. But it's using the mean as a measuring point. And it's gonna tell you how spread out from that. So when we find this one though, we sum all these up. So if I add up these numbers, I get, Add all these up, I get that equal to, that's nice, 360. So the sum of all those values is 360, right? And again, I'm still trying to find, what am I trying to find again? The- Standard deviation. Average, average deviation from the mean, the standard deviation, the average deviation. How do I find the average now? What can I do now? Divide by the number of values. Divide by the number of values, I'm gonna take Divide this by five and I get 360 divided by five and I get that equal to 72. Okay, so the average deviation here is 72. Does that make sense to you? Saying that the average deviation is 72? Go back yes. and look at your deviation. Go back and look at your deviations. Here are your deviations right here. Does 72 make sense? Think about that, does that make sense? I'm not saying that the average score is 72, by the way. I'm saying that the average deviation is 72. So I'm saying that most of these values deviate on average by 72 points. Does that make sense? Wouldn't it be the square root of 72? Good, and I want everybody else to understand that too. This number is not correct because what did we do to get it? We had to square values to get it. And what you're really doing is, let's say this is talking about test scores, and this is a squared test score which doesn't make any sense. So to fix this, we find the actual standard deviation. We find the actual standard deviation, right? Which is this 72 or this, which is just the square root of 72. Square root of 72 is 8.485. That is called the standard deviation, 8.485 points. So on average, we're gonna deviate, we're gonna deviate from a score of 70. On average, you're going to deviate from a score of 70 by about 8.5 points. We say about 8.5 points to make it simpler to read. Now, this number, 8.5, is a very biased number. It's a biased estimate. We call it a biased estimator. But what this says is that, let's write it out so you know, the average deviation. I'm right in terms of the context from 70 is 8.5 points. So we're talking about scores on the test. The average deviation from 70 is 8.5 points. So, you know, if the average is 70, then it wouldn't be gonna hurt if somebody score about a 78, 79, or somebody even score about a, what's 70 minus, about a 62, 61. Those scores would be typical in this particular data set, all right? That's what this is saying. Now, we have two types of standard deviation. 
And the standard deviation we just found, this right here, is called the, this is called the population standard deviation. The method we just used is called the population standard deviation. And that's because we divide it by the entire total. That's what we divided by the entire total five. If you divide by every value in the data set like that, you're saying you know everything in the population, which clearly we don't, we only have five scores. And so what I'm telling you is that this is what we call the population standard deviation. And it is a biased estimate, it is biased. It's what we call bias. The reason why it's biased is because we don't know every value in the data set. And because we know every value in the data set, we actually need more standard deviation than what's allowed to us. If everything was precise, then this standard deviation, this error, standard deviation is basically an error measurement. This error measurement would be pretty accurate. So because we don't know every value, we need more error is what they're telling us. So to do that, here's what I do. I want you to get this with me. Let me come back over here real quick because I didn't talk about this. This value right here that you found right here, it's called the variance. It's called the variance. The variance is the square deviation. This is the average square deviation from the mean. Hey, how's that different than the standard deviation real quick? How's it different than the standard deviation? Because it's squared. It's squared, thank you. It's called the variance. The variance is the average squared deviation from the mean. The standard deviation is just the average deviation from the mean. This again is called a population variance because you divide it by the entire total. The population variance is known as the Greek letter sigma, the lowercase sigma, and we call it sigma squared x. That's called the population variance. Therefore, the population standard deviation, so we call sigma x, is just the square root of the square. All right, they're Greek letters because they're population value. Here's how we make the adjustment. Here's how we make it unbiased. So to find the unbiased estimators, to make it unbiased, we're finding the sample values. The sample variance, the sample variance is what we call S squared of X. And here's the only difference, by the way. We're going to go through the exact same process, and we're going to find this 360 right here again, by the way. We're going to find that 360 again. But instead of dividing by this time, instead of dividing by this 5, instead of dividing by this 5, we want it to be bigger. So in order to make it bigger, here's what you're going to do to find S squared of X. S squared of X is going to be equal to 360 divided by one less than whatever your sample size is. So instead of dividing by five, we're now going to divide this by four. 360 divided by four. That is the only difference in the way this is calculated. And by dividing by four, it makes it an unbiased estimate. Dividing by one less than the sample size, it makes it slightly bigger. And if you're not very good with math, or you might be thinking, how is that possible? Think about fractions and like pizza, right? If the denominator is a smaller number, you always get a larger slice. If it's between two friends and four friends on the size of the pizza, well, two friends are gonna eat a lot more pizza than four friends would. If it's between four friends and eight friends, four friends are gonna eat a lot more pizza than eight friends would. They got that because you're splitting it up more. So if you divide this into a smaller number, it's always going to make that estimate bigger. As a matter so of fact, can it be this any is any number, or does it have to no, be one it's, less? It's always, it's always one less. Good question. Okay. It's always one less. 
Let's not make up our own rules. It's always one less. So always one less. So 360 divided by four is just 90. So the sample variance here, remember up here, the sample the population variance was 72, which is a smaller number. You're more precise. Here's a larger number, more error is 90. Now, to calculate the actual standard deviation, then how do we find the standard deviation from that? Square it. Square, not square it, but you said it right, but you meant the other way. Don't square it, but take oh, the- Oh, take the square root, sorry. So there you go, I know what you meant. Take the, thank you, take the square root of that. So the sample, there's what we call the sample standard deviation. is known as s of x. It's s of x, and it's just equal to square root of 90 here. What do we get for that? 9.486. Thank you, 9.486, which is also a number that is slightly bigger. Yeah. Not skew, just bigger. Just bigger than the number we got here. And that's what we want. We always want a number to be bigger. We always want the number to be bigger when we calculate that. And so I'm going to show you how to do this in Excel because Excel has a multitude of values that you can use. So um, if you go in and type those numbers into Excel real quick, and I'm going to actually give you the formulas for them, but I doubt you ever use the form because you're going to use Excel every time you do it. So I'm going to make it bigger. So, Test scores are so my scores are fifty seven, sixty four, seventy three, seventy five, and eighty one. All right, let's bring y'all into this. All right. So here's what I have those test scores typed in. Verify that the mean is um, 70 real quick. We can do that. So the mean distribution equals mean equals average, right? Average these numbers. Do that. I get a average of 70. Right, first part. Now, we could walk through, step through everything we just did and do it in Excel, by the way. Like I could literally sit here and do the deviations. To find the deviations, I would take, it would be equal to this minus this value. I don't know what I typed in, but it couldn't have been right. Um, equals this minus this value there. And then drag them down. Uh, I don't want to change the thing. I can't see anything, man. Do you put it in the front or do you put it in between? The dollar sign, anybody know? That wasn't the right spot. Anybody know? If you don't want the cells to change, I don't know. Like, I don't want to, I, want, I think it's in front too, because I think I did it last time, somebody told me to put it in front. Um, let me make sure. Man, I don't know. Am I right anything? <laughs> Equals this minus this. Uh-uh. It didn't like it right there either. I can't see it, y'all. I'm just gonna write it out. Yeah, percentage sign, a dollar sign. Yeah, it was a dollar sign. You put a percent sign. Oh, it's a dollar sign, but you have put a percent sign. I know, I know. I'm telling y'all, do I have an equal sign there right now? Yeah. Yes. I don't think y'all understand how much of a struggle this is right now. Put the the dollar sign right. Yes. That's number four. Number four. I got you. 
I got gotcha. you. What did it say? Hey, don't worry about that. I can't figure it out because I can't see anything. That's not your fault. That's my fault. But you could literally walk through, step through this, what we just did by hand. And I wish I could see because I would do it. I'm going to show you how to find the standard deviation just using the formula. So you have two formulas. Um, there is, you start typing the standard deviation. Uh, what does it say? Make that super big. I'm telling y'all I can't see. You see how you see standard deviation? So it's the second one, STDEV. Thank you. Um, I can't see myself set now. All right, so highlight your data, data set like this, there. What's that value? 9.48. Yeah, 9.48. So that is the, which standard, which standard deviation is that then? Is that our population or our sample? Our sample. That is our sample standard deviation. So using that formula there will give you the sample standard deviation. That's the standard deviation you want to find, all right? So it's literally just type in equals S, start typing in S standard deviation, it'll come up. And you just drag it over it. That's why I said, even if you don't, even if you don't know how to really calculate it, Excel will calculate it for you, all right? Next week, when I talk to y'all, I'm going to go over population standard deviations more because we're gonna talk about what we call um, the empirical rule. And in the empirical rule, there's a, also a formula for population standard deviation as well. All right, but just right now, just use that STD formula for the standard deviation of a sample because most of the things you're gonna deal with are going to be samples, by the way. Most of the things you're gonna deal with are gonna be samples. So um, any questions on the standard deviation part? I'm about to give you other formulas for that too. And again, I don't care if you know the formula, because again, you're going to use Excel most of, more often than not to calculate it, even when it asks you to calculate it by hand. I think on Blackboard, they force you to do it the way that I forced you to do it, which is why I did the example like that. And what I mean by that is they're going to make you walk through it. Like you're actually going to You're actually going to go find the deviations first, square the deviations, then divide it by, remember the sample gets divided by N minus one, the population gets divided by just straight N. So we're not gonna worry about the, in, the uh, population yet. So the ones you really need to know though, are the standard deviation, which we call S of X. That's equal to it. I'm gonna write it out how we got it. Here's what we did. We found X bar first and then we found every deviation from there. So I did every X minus the mean X bar. So find the deviations first, so X minus X bar. I tried to find the average of those deviations by adding them up, right? What happened though? When I added those deviations, what happened? What is zero? We got zero, so how do we fix that? Square it. We square, square it. it. So we're going to square it. We're going to find the deviation, square them, add them all up. That's what sum means. And divide this by n minus one. The problem with all of that, though, is that it's a squared value. So how do we undo the square? We take the square root. Here's the formula for the standard deviation. That is the formula for the standard deviation, right? You won't need it, but it's good to know that it's there. And again, you can break it down and see what we did. X minus X bar, the deviation. We square the deviations, we add them all up and then divide by N minus one, the sample size minus one. That's the sample standard deviation. If you want to find the variance, the variance S of X or S squared of X is what we call the variance. It's just everything inside of here. All right. Uh, any questions on the standard deviation part? 
I had one question, but it was just more so the difference between the biased versus the unbiased. Um, are we going to okay. need to find both of those each time, or was it just for just to just for this, just there? for the just to show you how to get there, just to tell you that it was biased versus unbiased. Generally speaking, I'm going to tell you to find one type. If I want the bias, when the bias was actually called the population, mm -hmm. and the oh, reason okay. that the reason y'all found the population part is because you didn't know that you were dividing by n minus one yet. You just know that okay. when you divide, when you find an average, you always divide by the total. An unbiased estimate for the variance and the standard deviation though always divides by n minus one. Always divides by one less. We need larger samples or larger. We need more. So that's a good question. Any other questions? All right, this last one we're gonna talk about. Let's talk about what we call quartiles. Uh, when we talk about quartile, quartile, uh, a quartile splits an ordered data set into because it's called quartiles, what do you think they split them into? How many parts? Four. Four. Four, Four equal parts. So we're going to take an ordered data set. We have to order our data set. Once that data set is ordered, it splits it into how many parts? Four equal parts, right? Um, we can show the quartile through what are known as a box and whisker plot. And in a box and whisker plot, here's how it sets up. The whisker extends to the minimum value on the left and the maximum value on the right. So within there is 100% of the data, all right? The edge of the box, the beginning of the box is what we call Q1, Q1. That makes the beginning of the box, also known as the lower quartile or you may even see it called the first quartile. It's the lower quartile of the first quartile. It's also represented as the it's Q1. That's the first quartile. The box is made from Q1, the first quartile to the upper quartile, which is called Q3. So the box is made from Q1 to Q3. So this is a way to display these quarters. So within the box is the middle quartile, also known as the median. The middle quartile, also known as the median. So this right here is your median. And I want you to look at this. When we look at this, because it's broken into quarters, and I want you to think of percentages. How much percentage sits from the min to Q1? What percentage of the data sits there? 25%. 25%. How much sits from Q1 to the median? 25. 25%. How much sits from the median to Q3? Same. 25%, right? How much sits from Q3 to the max? Again, 25%. So this is why we call them quartiles. They're putting things into fours or into quarters for us, all right? We have what's called the lower quarter, which is Q1. Q1 is the lower quarter. Q3 sets the upper quarter. How much data is there up to Q3, by the way? How much data is up to Q3? 75%. 75% sits up to Q3, which is how much data is above Q3? 25. Or so 100%. 25%, you said it right. 25% is above Q3. How much data is at the median? 50% 50, 50 right how much data is above the median 50 how much data is in between q1 and q3 50 50 right so this value right here is called the we call it the iqr we give it a special name it's called the iqr that stands for the interquartile range it's called the interquartile I misspelled quartile. T I L. -E. In a quartile, in right? Box. That's inside the box. So the IQR is represented by the IQR. Here's what it is the IQR is equal to Q3. It's actually Q3 minus Q1. And let's talk about why real quick. Why is it Q3 minus Q1? It's the interquartile range. What does the word inter mean? In between. 
between or within. So within the quartiles, you're within the quartiles and you're finding the range. How do you find the range again? Highest minus low. How do you find the max? The highest minus low. So you're finding the highest quartile, Q3, or in this case, within this range, the highest quartile within this range, Q3, lowest one is Q1. So it's called the inner quartile range, called the IQR. It represents the middle 50% of the data. Here is the middle 50% of the data. That's the middle 50%. That is a very important thing, by the way. The inner quartile range is the middle 50% of the data. So let's go find quartiles real quick, all right? Let's find quartiles. Um, we can go put this data into Excel. We can go put this data into an Excel. As a matter of fact, we probably should put this data into Excel. Um, is this data ordered already, yes or no? Yes. Yes, so I wanna find, show you how to find quartiles by hand first, all right? And to find a quartile by hand, I want you to realize a couple of things. We're breaking the data into four. We're breaking the data into four equal parts, right? Well, the natural way to do that, and here's what you already know to do, is to first by start by breaking the data in half. Once you break it in half, you can break it in half again on this side, and you'll break it in half again on this side. Y'all got that? So when I do this, then, the first thing I want to do is I want to find the minimum maximum value. These numbers that I'm finding out here, by the way, these five numbers that I'm going to write right here, they're called the five number summary. They're called the five number summary. Every numerical data set can be summarized by five numbers. And those five numbers represent the quartiles of the data. All right. So the first thing I do is identify the min and the max values. What are my min and max values here? 43 is the minimum, 96 is the maximum. So 43 min, 96 is the max. First step, find min and max. Now they have the min and the max, the next thing is to find the median because the median is a value you should not define. How do we find the median? Well, we have how many values here? Two, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have 18 values. Yes. Where would the median lie if you have 18 values? What's 18 divided by two? Nine point or nine. Yeah. Nine, so it'd be nine and 10. It'd be, a, it'd be right between nine and 10 here, all right? And so we're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Here's nine and 10, so watch. If you get confused about, let's say you think it's 77. The first thing you should do is verify that 77 is the median. How do I do that? How many numbers should be on this side? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. On this side, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So is 77 going to be the median? No. No, not the same amount, right? Let's say, okay, it's not 77. Hold on. Let's say, okay, it's not 77, but I think it's the other value next to it, which is 80, right? Let's say I say it's 80, so I circle 80. So again, how many do I have on this side? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Is that the median then? No. That's also not the median. So that tells me the median has to sit where? At 81. Or somewhere 70, in between those two 25. values. Yeah, somewhere in between those two values. Let's have to figure out how do we find the middle between those two values? To find that median, then we're going to take the one on the left, which is 77. Good. 77 plus 80 and divided by two. We're going to find the average between those two values. So 77 plus 80, what is it divided by two? 78.5. So there goes your median. Now, the nice thing about this though is we split the data into equal parts. How many are on the left side of that line? How nine. many numbers on the left side? Nine, how many on the right side? Nine. Nine, nine right? Nine, nine has a natural middle, by the way. Nine has a natural middle, you got that? As a matter of fact, what's nine divided by two? 
What's nine divided 4. by 2? 4.5. Anytime you divide an odd number by something, you're going to get, anytime you divide an odd number by 2, you're always going to get a 0. 0.5. We always round that up. So 9 divided by 2 is 4.5, round up to the 5. We want to find the fifth value of the data set. So 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Here is Q1. That is Q1. I'm sorry, can you go over that again? So all I did was I said, so yeah. look, what's nine divided by two? Nine divided by two is four point five. Round it up to the round it up to the nearest whole number, which is five. That means I'm going five numbers into the data set. One, two, three, four, five is this number right here. This is just the median. Q1 is just the median of this side of that line. And we can verify that how many numbers on how many numbers on the left side of, of this 62? There's one, on two, side. three, four. How many are on this side? One, two, three, four. So it's just the median of this side of the data. Do the same thing over here, right? You have nine numbers over here again, so we're gonna go five into it. One, two, three, four, five. So it looks like 90 is going to be Q3. And again, you count the number of values on this side, you have one, two, three, four. On this side, one, two, three, four. And so now I know Q1 is 62. And Q3 is 90. And there go my values. So the quartiles then, if I want to sketch them out, because I do want to sketch them in terms of a box plot now. What I'm going to do is, the whiskers at 43, right? The first opening, Q1 starts at 62. And goes up to, where is it at up to 90, right? That's at 90. This is at 78.5. And then the end goes up to 96. And this shows that, so if I ask you, I can ask you questions like this. How much data sits between, um, 90 and 96. What percentage of value sit between data? What percentage of value sit between 90 and 96? 25 percent. 25%. What percentage of value sit between 43 and 90? 75. 75. What percentage of value sit between 62 and 90? 50. 50. Good. So you should be able to answer questions like that. Y'all got that? Um, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna call it, I'm gonna call it a night. My eyes are killing me, you guys. Um, I will show you, I will put a video up on how to do this in Excel, how to actually calculate it through Excel. I'm just, I don't, I can't, I can't actually do it in Excel right now, to be honest, but I will put a video up to show y'all how to do it in Excel. And I will actually go over that next time I see y'all too as well. All right. Thank you. Yeah, hey, no worries. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you sir. Thank Take you. care. Yes. Yeah. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Better. Take care. Thank you. Yeah, hope you will get well soon. Thank you. Yeah, have a good night. Bye bye.